Okay, if you brought your Bible, we're in Acts chapter 25. This is part 110 of our verse-by-verse series through the book of Acts. This teaching began way back in January 2016 and continues on through to right now. And we left off last week having stated that Paul was a man who knew his rights as a Roman citizen. Uh, we do have handouts up front if anybody would like to use one. Paul knew his rights as a Roman citizen, and he also knew that he was innocent of all of these charges uh, against him. And because Paul had been a responsible Roman citizen, he could appeal to Caesar and in doing so claim Rome's protection. So we took an application from this last time, and we mentioned how that the same thing can be said for you and I as children of the Most High God. There's a certain peace... Amen. There's a certain peace and a certain assurance that comes from knowing that our sins have been forgiven and washed away in the precious blood of the Lamb. There's a peace that comes from that. And just knowing that the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only sinless man who's ever lived, has been imputed to our account. And therefore, when we stand before God in judgment, we will not be found guilty because of the righteousness of Christ. It doesn't matter what other people say about you. It doesn't matter what other people may think about you. When people say and think things about you that are far from the truth of who you really are, it doesn't change our standing in God one little bit. And when you know this and you live your life in light of this reality, you'll have peace that this world cannot give and praise God, this world can't take it away. I rejoice in that. Why? Because this is peace that's found in Jesus. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the entire world could just learn that simple truth? Wouldn't it be grand if they could not only learn it, but grasp the implications of it and live their lives according to the scriptures? Having enough love for Jesus to seek to honor him by operating according to the dictates of his word and not our personal thoughts and feelings and preferences. That'd be great. Let's go ahead and read the rest of chapter 25 here. We left off with verse number 13. So let me read verse 13, and then we'll read on through to the end of the chapter. It'll take us three minutes or so to do that, and then we'll come back and uh, examine this a little bit closer. Verse 13, and after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came of the Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's case unto, unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priest and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him, to whom I answered, it is not the manner, manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, when they were come hither without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth against whom when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I suppose but had certain questions against him of their own superstition, and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city, at Festus's commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, that King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined 
to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and specially before thee, O king Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. Back in verse number 13, once again it says, And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus, and when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priest and the elders of the Jews informed me, desired to have judgment against him. Now this was Herod Agrippa the second. Herod Agrippa the second was the son of Anybody know? King Agrippa the first. Herod Agrippa the first. That's right. Very good. He was the last of the Herod dynasty that ruled from about 40 B.C. to about 100 A.D. So this is a, a part of the what, what is called the Herod dynasty. There were several Herods mentioned in the Bible, and this is Herod Agrippa uh, the second. So when we look at the Herod dynasty all the way down to Agrippa the second here, we see a long line of men who followed after the mistakes of their fathers. Sadly, that's what they followed after. They didn't learn the lessons. They didn't watch their fathers make mistakes and do like wise men do and learn from the mistakes of others. They just followed right in with everybody else's mistakes that came before them. And they all stayed caught up in this unending cycle of poor judgment and wicked lifestyles. And every generation of the Herod uh, dynasty, they all had an encounter with God. They all had an encounter with God. And they all failed to follow God's righteous ways. So the setting of chapter 25 here in the book of Acts would have been somewhere around the year 60 A.D., and Agrippa would have been about 33 years old here. 33 years old. He had quite a bit of an authority for a man of so few years. He had the power to uh, remove the high priest. He, he also con uh, controlled the temple treasury. And Bernice was his sister. And I really hesitate to go into a whole lot of detail about Bernice and this situation here with her. I hesitate to talk about that in mixed company, but just know this. From what I've read and studied about Bernice, uh, she was a very depraved woman, very depraved individual. And she appears here with Agrippa, who also happened to be her brother, because they have come to congratulate Festus on his new position. So in the course of this visit, Festus brings up Paul's case to Agrippa, Agrippa himself was of Jewish descent, and he would have been able to offer some clarity about Paul's case to Festus. It was Agrippa's great-grandfather, Herod the Great. He was the one who ordered all the male children under two years old to be put to death because he was trying to kill Jesus. That was Agrippa's great-grandfather. So the whole family had an encounter with God, and they fought against the Lord Jesus Christ for decades. This family did. And another one of Agrippa's relatives met Jesus face to face at Jesus' trial, but he just didn't realize who it was that he was dealing with. And now Agrippa, along with his sister Bernice, by the gracious hand of Almighty God, he gets to hear the message again. He gets to hear it again. The sad thing about it is we see no evidence that any of these people ever repented and believed and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see no evidence that they ever came to a saving knowledge of the Lord. We see no indication that they ever became born again to everlasting life. And here's an application for us today. What is it that our children see in us? What kind of example are we setting for the next generation? Are we setting a positive example of people who love God and people who worship God and live our lives to honor Him and to bring Him glory? Or are we just leading them farther and farther down the pathway that leads to destruction? A, a man or a woman who is a genuine believer, a genuine, true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, will be seeking to leave 
behind a legacy that points their kids and their grandkids to Jesus, that points them to the cross and what Jesus did when he hung and bled and died on the old rugged cross and rose again for our justification. That lost man, that lost woman out there, they won't care anything about the example that they're setting. It won't even occur to them, uh, you know, about Jesus and following him. They're just going to run right along with the world. They're just going to live lives as enemies of God with no conviction. But I say tonight, Lord, give us conviction. Give us conviction, God. Amen. Give us conviction to be the kind of people who will be a light for our kids and our grandkids. Give us a conviction to want to be a light for the generations to come. Because we're going to leave here. We're going to depart from this life one day after a while. So this meeting here between Herod and Agrippa, it was a diplomatic meeting between two rulers of neighboring territory. Now, the relationship between the Herod family and the Roman governors has always been a touchy and a complicated relationship. And we see that in Scripture. Uh, we see it with Herod Antipas and Pontius Pilate. You may remember how the two of them were just kept sending Jesus back and forth. Send him to Herod. No, send him to Pilate. That was because of the touchy complicatedness of the relationship between these two ruling parties. It was usually the Roman governor who had the charge over the military. And the Herod dynasty ruled over the temple and the priesthood. Both rulers answered to Rome, but the Roman governor, which would have been Festus here, that Roman governor would have had more responsibility in answering to Rome because it would have been the Roman governor who was a direct appointee by Caesar himself. So both groups, the Herod dynasty and the Roman rulers, they found it equally challenging to govern these Jews. That was a problem for both groups. The Jews viewed the Romans as a bunch of godless people, and although the Herods were part Jewish themselves, the other Jews just looked upon them as, well, just, they're just a group that's using their Jewishness for their own political selfishness, for their own motivation. They're just using it to further their own selfish agendas. So this is a lengthy visit from Agrippa and Bernice. The Bible tells us that they had been there many days before Festus even began to discuss Paul's case. He started out the discussion by giving Agrippa a bit of a summary of the case. And uh, Festus made sure to let Agrippa know that it was the chief priest and the elders of the Jews who had brought these charges against Paul to begin with. So the reason Festus wanted to stress that fact to Agrippa was because he knew that Agrippa had some great influence over them. Why? Because he would have been the one who appointed the high priest himself. That was part of his job. And he controlled the temple treasury. So when uh, Festus tells Agrippa that the Jews are desiring to have a judgment against Paul, that's not just talking about, well, they want to get this, this little favorable verdict in their favor. No, they want Paul to be condemned. They want him to be put to death. Verse number 16. To whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that which he is, he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, when they were come hither without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. So Festus is giving Agrippa the Roman version of the case against the Apostle Paul. He's basically saying the same thing that Gallio said in chapter 18, and he's basically saying the same thing that Claudius Lysias, the chief captain, said back in chapter 23, so the Jews were angry and upset over theology. That's what it all boiled down to for them. It was all about theology. They were mad because the Apostle Paul interpreted the Old Testament in such a fashion that supported Jesus' claims to be the risen Savior and the Messiah. And it's interesting, since we're right here this close to Easter, 
And we've already preached two out of the four messages that we had intended to preach about the resurrection. It's quite amazing because the resurrection of Jesus is really what got them all tore up here. That's what they're mad about. The resurrection. Festus could not grasp the resurrection. He was a pagan ruler. And the resurrection would have been unfathomable to him. He doesn't really see this case as a matter of Roman law. It's not a matter of the Roman law to him. He sees it as an internal debate about Jewish matters. And it's interesting when you look at Paul's case here and you place Paul's case beside the case of Jesus, there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of parallels between Paul and Jesus here. Both Jesus and Paul were prosecuted before a Roman governor. Jesus went before Pontius Pilate and Paul comes before Festus. Then they were both brought before Jewish kings. Jesus was brought before Herod Antipas. Paul was brought before King Agrippa here. Both Paul and Jesus were found innocent. And Jesus was sent onto the cross to be crucified. And Paul is going to be sent off to Rome to stand further trial. So whether Paul realizes it or not, and I feel confident that he does, He's walking the same pathway that Jesus walked. Verse number 18. Against whom when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I suppose. That's his way of saying it didn't go the way I thought it would. But had certain questions against him of their own superstition. And of one Jesus which was dead, but whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him, whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. So what we're seeing here is how all of these trumped up charges that the Jewish leaders had brought against Paul, all of that's beginning to fade out in light of what the real issue is, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. That's the real issue. Paul says Jesus rose again, and they just can't stand it. They can't stand it. They despise that. They hate that. This world can't stand it today. If they could somehow take Jesus and put him back in the grave and keep them in the grave, they'd do it in a heartbeat. But they can't do it. Why? Because they don't have the power to hold Jesus down. And they don't have the power to hold you down. When you're risen with him, they'll try to hold you down. They'll try with all they've got because this world hates a child of God. But like we said here Sunday morning, there is resurrection power available to the child of God. There's resurrection power available to all who believe. And there is great power in prayer. And these are things that are ours. God has given these things to us. And we need to make use of these things as children of God. So Festus is basically explaining to Agrippa that the charges against Paul were not quite what he had anticipated. He's saying to Agrippa, Agrippa, I don't fully understand it all, but this seems to be about a dead man named Jesus who Paul says is alive. And Agrippa, I really don't know how to handle all this. And I think the part that really had Festus stuck was the part about the dead man being alive again. I think that's what had him all tore up. But let's give old Festus a little bit of credit here because he's actually showing a quality of a good leader. Good leaders know their limitations and they're not afraid to admit when they're in over their heads. A good leader will ask for help from someone when he or she needs it. So kudos to Festus on that. Bravo, Festus. I wish some of our leaders in America would admit their limitations and ask for help from some, somebody who actually cares about right or wrong. I'd love for some of our leaders in America to take a lesson from Festus out of the Bible on this. So Festus tells Agrippa that the reason he wanted to move Paul's trial to Jerusalem was because of the religious nature of the case and not because of any type of political pressure, whether that's the whole truth or not, I don't know. So when I think about the problem that Festus had before him, I see that today's post-Christian world and those with secular mindsets, they seem to have the same problem. 
They are unbelievers. They do not understand the truth. They can't define the truth. Well, we just saw a situation with this new Supreme Court justice who couldn't even define what a woman was. I wasn't planning on getting into that, but they can't define the truth. Truth, according to them, is just something that's relative to the individual. If I wake up tomorrow and I feel like a woman, well, I'll be a woman. If I feel like a man the next day, I'll be a man. It doesn't really matter about reality. All that matters is what I say and what I feel. Even the word God means something completely different to people who are secular-minded. When we try to share the gospel with people, you just can't automatically assume from the outset that they know what you're talking about when you mention God or Jesus. We need to spend some time listening to people and comparing their views with the standard of truth. What is the standard of truth? Somebody tell me, what's the standard of truth? God's Word. Amen. That's exactly right. God's Word is the standard of truth. That's where the Christian will go when we need to know what truth is. We'll go to God's Word. It's a characteristic of someone who is saved. Go to the Bible for truth and guidance and direction. Now that person who's out there who's unregenerate, that rebel against God, that lost man or that woman out there who doesn't know God, they're not going to go to the Bible. They're going to go to the philosophers and the college professors and the spiritualists and the politicians and on and on we could go. The problem is none of those people are the arbiter of truth. None of those people are the definer of truth. Now you may be somebody who has one of those very rare college professors who actually is a godly individual. There's still, thankfully, a, a very few of those out there. I believe there are few, but they're still out there. We heard that Donna had a godly doctor today. I'm thankful for that. So there's some godly people still out there. I thank God for them. And there's nothing wrong with seeking counsel with them on certain matters, but most of the college campus scene, from my experience, is, are not godly, and none of them are the definer of truth. Only God has that title. That belongs only to God. So that, that means so much to me that I have staked my entire existence in this life on knowing that when I need understanding and I need help and guidance and direction, I can call on the name of the Lord and he'll show me how to apply the gospel in the midst of an ever-changing world. So in regard to the fact that Jesus is the risen Savior, you know, you could go all over this world and find grave sites, famous grave sites where famous people have been buried and they've been laid to rest. The pyramids over in Egypt, they contain the bodies of the ancient pharaohs. You could go to Memphis, and find the grave of Elvis on the grounds there at Graceland. They called him the king, king of rock and roll. You could go to Seattle, Washington. They've got the king of kung fu, Bruce Lee, buried in Seattle, Washington, right beside of his son, Brandon. You could go there and see it. You could go to Arlington and visit the final resting place of John F. Kennedy. Over in Saudi Arabia, they've got a place called the Green Dome. And up under that green dome is said to lie the remains of the Islamic prophet Muhammad under the green dome. And I could go on and on and on with that. But you know that garden tomb where they laid Jesus is empty. Yep. It's been empty for almost 2,000 years. There's no bodies there. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, man. Verse number 21. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved under the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. Now I studied long and hard on verse number 21. And the reason for that, I don't know, it just it hung me up for a little while. And I just wanted to make absolute certain that Augustus and Caesar are the same person. And that's what I've concluded, that, that it is the same person. If anyone finds that's not the case, 
and you show me some convincing information, then I'll stand corrected. But it does appear to me that Augustus and Caesar are referring to the same man. Augustus is a term that literally means the revered one. And it was a term that was commonly applied to the emperor, also referred to as Caesar, after Julius Caesar, who was the first in the line of these emperors. And it would be the responsibility of Festus to keep Paul in custody until he could send him before Caesar. And hopefully we can begin to see exactly what the dilemma was for Festus. Because Festus is still in a dilemma here. It was, I, I, I'm convinced, like we said before, that it was a bit of a relief to him when Paul appeared, uh, appealed to Caesar, but he still got this dilemma. When I send Paul to Caesar, what am I going to tell him that I'm sending him for? Because we can't find that he's done anything wrong. So he's having a real dilemma about this. Paul's already appealed to Caesar, but before Festus sends Paul to Caesar, he needs to come up with a valid charge. He doesn't really understand all of what the Jews have charged him with. And he sees all of those quibbles as just superstition. So he needs Agrippa's help to come up with a valid charge before he can send Paul on to the emperor. So Agrippa says, well, let me hear it myself. And I'll see what he says. And when you break down that phrase that says, I would also hear the man myself. When you break that down in the original Greek, it comes with the idea that Agrippa had been waiting to hear Paul for a long time. He'd been wanting to hear what Paul had to say for quite a while. So no doubt he had heard about Paul, and he wanted to hear what Paul had to say about Jesus. So Festus says, tomorrow you will. You'll hear him tomorrow. You'll get your chance tomorrow. So the hearing before Agrippa is now set for the following day. And this is going to be a yet, just yet another opportunity for, for some high-ranking officials and some people of notoriety to hear the gospel. Namely, Festus, Agrippa, Bernice, anybody else who might have been in their company, they're going to hear straight from Paul about this dead man who came back to life. Look at verse 23 as we hurry on here. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was, was come and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and the principal men of the city at Festus' command, but Paul was brought forth. So the next day rolls around, and all of these ugly people, they sashay into this big judgment hall, and when the Bible says that they entered with great pomp, it's the Greek word phantasia, it's the word we get our word fantasy from, that sort of gives you a little picture in your mind's eye. The word Fantasius, it actually means pageantry. Pageantry. So there was Governor Festus, there was King Agrippa, there was Bernice and whoever else, and it was like a pageant when all of these people came into the judgment hall. It was like some kind of show or some kind of great display. That sounds really impressive, doesn't it? God wasn't impressed with it. God wasn't impressed at all. I can promise you that. As far as God is concerned, the greatest one in the room was the prisoner. Paul was standing there as a child of the king. The king. Yes. The real king. The king of kings. There would have been military officers there. Some sources I found indicate that the military number of people that would have been present could have been in the thousands here. There would have been some prominent men of Caesarea there as well. And it's unlikely from what I've studied that Paul would have been given any advance notice whatsoever of this hearing. So he had no time to prepare a case. But either way, that's okay because Paul knew how to depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to tell him what to say. Look uh, back in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, Jesus had said something about this. Luke 12, verse number 11. And when they bring you into the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer. Of what ye shall say. 
for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Paul was trusted completely in the Lord. He didn't let his status as a prisoner stop him from telling these people about Jesus. This was an opportunity. May God help us all to see our circumstances as opportunities. Now for most people today, when they're faced with doing something that they'd rather not do, or going somewhere they'd rather not go, most of us will start complaining about our circumstances. Rather than complain, we need to ask God to help us in every situation. Help us to trust Him and help us to share the gospel with those that we might not have otherwise encountered. Now, in my years of construction, and I know I've been talking a lot about my years of construction lately, but that's just my, my well of experience. That's what I have to draw from in my life, and I've got a lot of that. But I've been sent out to many a job site that I didn't want to go to. I know, Johnny, you have too. Amen? I've been called out to some places and had, had to go to work in some circumstances and locations among people that I just would rather not have been there. And I've had to climb way up in the air and work in spaces so tight and cramped that you barely had enough room to lay down on top of a piece of ductwork or something about 40 feet in the air to do what you had to do. And it would be there many times in a location like that where I would write a scripture, a Bible verse up on a firewall somewhere or leave a gospel track up there. And later on someone would come behind me and let me know how it blessed them to find it. And I hated to go to these places. I dreaded it so bad. I dreaded it so bad I lost sleep over it. But when I asked the Lord to help me, He always did. He helped me to see the things that I considered to be problems for what they really were. They were opportunities. Look at verse number 24 here. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, you see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I had determined to send him. So Festus opens the proceedings and Luke made sure that he's going to record this exoneration of Christianity by a Roman governor. He's going to make sure to record that so that would be helpful to future Christians. And he explained how the Jewish leaders were wanting Paul to be executed, but as far as he could tell, Festus said that Paul had not been guilty of anything worthy of death. And that was a very crucial statement for Festus. Don't let that slip by without understanding what that means. When Festus said that, that would have served as a hedge against those who were prosecuting and imprisoning Christians in Roman regions. Verse 26, as we hurry on here, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord, wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not with all to signify the crimes laid against him. Festus is basically saying, guys, Paul has appealed to Caesar here, and I, I don't have anything to tell Caesar. I don't have a legitimate crime. I don't have anything to report. And it would have been the responsibility of Festus to prepare a legal briefing to send uh, the emperor for the appeal process. Festus is explaining to them, I don't know what to say about the matter. So he needs Paul to be examined, and the idea was that Agrippa would be able to hear Paul and come up with the right words to formulate some kind of charge to send along with Paul when he goes before the emperor. Since Agrippa was said to be a, an expert on Jewish controversies. So that was the plan. Now let me give you this brief closing application and then we'll end it for tonight. Both Felix and Festus examined Paul and they were both forced to admit that they could not find a crime that Paul had been guilty of. That's because Paul was a good Roman citizen. 
But far more importantly than that, he lived with integrity and he lived with conviction before God. He had not broken any civil laws and therefore he had nothing to hide. So think about this. Think about this and I'll leave you with this. How would you handle it if your life came under close scrutiny? How would you handle that? How would you, how would you handle it if your life came under examination by somebody who was indifferent to God or adverse against God? What would those people be able to say about you? You see, these Jewish leaders, they hated Paul because of the stand he took for Jesus. And they tried to trump up some charges against him, but they couldn't make those charges stick because Paul had done nothing wrong. So when your accusers come and they're accusing you, will they be able to prove their accusations? of the crimes or the sins of your life or will they be forced to say as Daniel said or as it was said of Daniel by his accusers in Daniel 6 and 5 we shall not find any occasion against him except we find it against him concerning the law of his God in other words they had nothing to say about Daniel they, could, they had nothing to prove they could prove nothing they had nothing to accuse him of except the fact that he served God. Let us all be accused and found guilty of serving God. Amen. On your handout. I don't have a PowerPoint. I literally just forgot to do the PowerPoint. I was getting my stuff ready to walk out the door for church and realized that I just completely forgot it. So that's all right. We still got our little handout here. Number one says... The Herod dynasty contained a lot of men who followed the blank of their fathers. That's mistakes. They followed the mistakes of their fathers. Number two, in Acts 25, King Agrippa, it was Herod Agrippa II, would have been about how many years old? 33. 33. Good job. Number three, Bernice was a very moral and godly woman who followed the Lord in faith and obedience. That is false. Number four, it was usually the Roman governor who had the charge of the military. Good. And the Herod dynasty ruled over the temple and the priesthood. Number five, Festus fully understood the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What was that? False. He didn't fully understand it. He might have had some knowledge, but he didn't fully understand it. Number six, the word God will often mean something completely different to secular-minded people than it does to genuine Christians. True. True. Number seven, blank is a term that literally means the revered one. Augustus. Number eight, Agrippa had been wanting to hear Paul for a long time. True. Number nine, when the Bible says that they entered with great pomp, the word is fantasious, which means pageantry. Right. It's pageantry. Yeah. Now, fantasy, of course, you know, that would be that would be right in a sense because that's where we get our word fantasy from. So yeah. Either one of those would be acceptable, but we're looking for pageantry very specifically. Paul was likely given no time to prepare for this hearing. True or false? True. True. We don't see any evidence that they called him ahead of time and said, Paul, you're going to have a hearing tomorrow. Seems to me like they just kind of sprung it on him. That's all right. God was with him. Amen. Any questions about what was taught tonight? He did have two years in prison, though. He was in prison for two years. Amen. Anybody else? I just put that on there. I wasn't going to comment, comment on it. The, thing, the graphic on the back, though, I don't have it on mine. I just, I, I had that in the book, and I just wanted to copy that so you'd have it. it. Sort of breaks down all the Herods. Maybe you find that interesting. Anybody with a question? Comment. All right. Come on up here, Don. Give us a song. We'll close out. Thank you all for your attention tonight.
pray the service is a help and a blessing to you. in the name of Jesus, we thank you, dear God. We thank you, God, for your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you, God, for allowing us to have this time to study tonight. 